welcome everyone. Uh, this is a pretty cool opportunity. I, I like what we've started doing here uh, with the community for the community where Bella receives, I mean, as Ace can testify, just, you know, reached out to him via email. Here's what I'm doing with my trading. Here's where I might give you some help. And uh, we say, hey, let's let's do a webcast. Let's work together on this and let's do it in a format where everyone can learn together and uh, get better from it. So that's kind of part of our culture here and what we do. And so we're just kind of bringing that to SMB you know, community and, and whatnot as well. Yeah, um, and I might say, you know, one of the things that I've learned over the years is our best traders surprise us in terms of their pedigree. So one of our top traders has not graduated from college, started with us while he was in college and uh, decided it wasn't for him. Uh, one of our traders who runs our options desk, Seth Freudberg, came to us as a student and now runs our options trading desk. Uh, we have about 15 traders on that side of the business and they're doing very nicely. And my point to that is I'm not sure I would have expected that when we first met him, that this was going to be somebody who ended up running our desk in the sense that he was a retail trader, you know, just trying to make some supplemental income. Uh, Andrew Faldi came to us as a student and, you know, now trailing 12 months as our top options trader based on performance. Probably one of our other top traders on the desk didn't necessarily go to the greatest college or, or, or have a remarkable background. I was at an event last night with StockTwits and Dr. Steenbarger was the headline and he presented three ideas to the StockTwits community for them to improve their trading. And he said, one, you gotta be innovating, two, you gotta be doing something that other people are not doing, three, you gotta be thinking about uh, ways to be competing in this different marketplace in a low volatility marketplace. And one of the ways that our desk does things where the bigger players don't, so we can be very competitive, is uh, we trade low float stocks. Some of our guys trade low float stocks. And, you know, so the last couple of days we were trading AEZS, we were trading dry ships, and you know, those are trade, those are stocks that you all can, can, can participate in. But, you know, even at our level, we're, we're doing things, we're doing things differently. And, you know, even at our level, our best guys are coming from places that you, you wouldn't expect. And so um, I sort of chimed in about highlighting, supplementing Dr. Steenbarger's point. And, you know, then I, I said, there's going to be a couple of people in this audience. It's a sold out event, packed, uh, packed house. Um, and I said, there's going to be a couple of you who become really great traders and please come talk to me. <laughs> Number one, if you think you're going to be that person, but what's great about this event and what's great about this community is that they're really bright people that you can leverage off of. And, we have a, a great community and there are very talented people who are not quite pro level yet, but might become that. And you know, one of the home runs for us is to meet people who become uh, good enough to trade in our desk or interesting enough to trade in our desk. Um, and you know, a merit, you sort of never, I guess my overall point is you never know where people are going to come from. Merit encouraged me to meet with somebody who his was in his uh, chat room while I was in Chicago and uh, took the meeting. It was sort of definitely a one-off, met this person for breakfast in Chicago, had no expectations at all. And halfway through the meeting, it was pretty clear to me that this is somebody who should apply to the firm. And it did, and we just uh, sent out an invitation and he accepted and, and he'll be in our September class. 
um, somebody from our community, some something really unexpected. And so, yep. you know, I would encourage you all who are listening to turn over lots of rocks and to be open minded to having conversations with different people. Because uh, a, they're probably more talented than you might think originally, and b, you kind of, you kind of never know where they're going to come from. Um, so, Ace, maybe you're going to be that next person, but if not, no worries. And uh, you know, it's good. It's a good learning experience for us to be talking to people and and getting a feel for hey, what are the things you're struggling with, what are the things you're thinking about. Um, sometimes. Anyway, that's that's that we learn a lot because because then we can better understand what some of our newer guys are going through as well. Yep. And just real quick before we get started with the the actual mentoring and, and working with Ace here, um, I just want to say that we're doing a thing right now where we're offering you guys, our community, this ability to spend time with us, talk with us, um, specifically myself. Or if you're focused on options, you can talk with Seth Freudberg, who runs the options desk. Um, you can spend an hour with us. We're charging $79. It's typically hundreds of dollars an hour to work with myself or Seth. Um, so this is just a really, really good chance for you at a essentially no risk. I'll tell you about that. Um, to spend time with us, develop a plan. Let me go through, let me shoot holes in your plan for an hour. That, that's essentially what one of the things I really want to do. Um, let me grill you on how you're preparing before the session. Let me grill you on how you're actually quantifying your edge, if you have an edge at all. Let me grill you on ways that you're adding something to your routine each day um, to notice how the market is changing and how you may need to adapt to it. Um, you know, let someone with over a decade of experience or more, depending on who you talk to, um, grill your plan and help you come out the other end better. It's, I think, $79. If you hate it and it was a waste of your time, we'll give you your money back. That's never happened, um, but we will honor that. Um, if you end up mentoring with myself or mentoring with Seth on a more formal basis, we'll, we'll apply that full $79 towards that. So really nothing to lose um, unless you just really don't like us. I, I don't see a reason not to take advantage of that opportunity and then use that time to get better working with uh, professionals. So I just think it's a really, really great opportunity. SMBU.com backslash mentoring is where you can take a look at that and, um, and, and get, there's the link uh, at the bottom there. If you just have questions about it, there's my email address in black at smbcap.com. Don't be afraid, I, I don't bite, reach out, let's, let's talk about it and we, as Bella pointed out, we want to have these interactions with people, we want to be meeting people, we want to be talking with Ace here today, we want to do these things we're always looking for talent. We're always looking for the next people to hire and, and put on the desk. And at worst case scenario, you walk away from that hour um, a little bit more prepared to get better the following day, the following week, the following month. So that's what it's all about. All right, great. So let's get to Ace's question. I'm gonna bring it up here. So Ace, you reached out to us. Do you have that original email? Um, I do somewhere, I'm sure I do. I got it. I can read it out if you want. All right, go for it. Uh, hope all is well. First things first, thank you for taking the time to speak with me and make yourself available to a complete stranger. I truly You're appreciate it. You're welcome, Eric. Sorry for the delayed and verbose email. I recently finished reading Japanese candlestick charting techniques and one good trade and wanted to digest them both before furthering the conversation. Already Bit know. Already know. Brilliant. IQ brilliant. <laughs> Um, a bit about myself, 29 year old, um, working in television production, um, started trading in 2015, wasn't able to dedicate the time necessary to studying until recently. Hey, so um, can I, can I cut in? So Ace, uh, you're in television production. Uh, tell us a little bit about what you were doing and what you're working on. 
Um, yeah, so I just wrapped a show with um, with Viceland called Jungle Town, and um, yeah, so my background is in editing, camera work, producing, and just my main nine to five is packaging content for networks. So um, I got interested in the market, I think in 2008 or so, a few of my friends bought shares in Apple. Um, they're enjoying that right now. 2015 came around, um, had a little bit of pot money in my pocket, wanted to start learning. Um, as I said in the email, didn't really have the time to start learning, um, which did me a great disservice. So um, the show that I'm working on, or the show that I just wrapped, um, allowed me the opportunity to take a couple months to really, you know, hit the ground run, or not really hit the ground running, but, um, you know, pound the pavement, learn as much as I can, and just really study the fundamentals of trading so that when I decide to, um, you know, start with a live account, I'm stepping with my best foot forward. We, uh, in our building, there is the nicest couple who has these now two beautiful girls and the mother is very sweet and very uh very kind to my two children and uh we've started we've, we've gotten to know them and uh they we eventually uh had dinner and, and they invited us over and um and he's like the most unassuming guy in the world and and, and she's really sweet she's uh she's actually from mexico and, and he's from long island and uh, you know, we we kind of knew them, but didn't really know them. And then we went up to their apartment, and not to in any way be superficial, but the apartment was the penthouse in the building that we live in, and the outdoor space wrapped all the way around the building. And uh, my wife and I walked in, and it was just it was really an amazing apartment. And you just never would have thought of it from it's one of the things about New York is that you sort of never know what people are doing. And it turns out that he creates uh, music for television shows. So uh, he was working on a, a hit show that just sort of hires him and sits down and writes the jingles and stuff that needs to be Jingles are for commercials. Scores are for shows. Okay. <laughs> I stand corrected. That's that's why he has the penthouse. He's too much Mad Men. You've been watching too much Mad Men. That's one of the great shows of all time. We could do a whole separate webinar on the best show of all time. <laughs> um, but a really interesting guy. And uh, yeah, there's so much opportunity in TV. And this is sort of like the, the golden age of television, I think, now as well. So many good shows. Anyway, uh, Mary, right, so let's, continuing uh, on, I have no idea why you just told that story. All right, from what I've gathered, I'm more of a momentum trader who plays reversal and breakout setups using Fib ratios, uh, moving averages, MACD and RSI. I'm also learning to read the tape and some swing trade setups to build my account. I've stepped away from live trading for a few months to get reps and build a stronger fundamental foundation on a simulator um, uh, with the uh, TradingSim.com and Thinkorswim. Um, I'm in month three of my sabbatical and with all the new information, I want to make sure I'm heading in the right direction with as much focus as possible. A breadth of information is always great, but I'd hate to By the way, we're getting a lot of people in the chat who really like my story. So. <laughs> really Next couple of months. I don't, I don't judge you. I mean. <laughs> Next couple of months, I'm learning the Greeks and when I should spend this time on price action or anything else. You mean Greeks around, Greeks around opposite trading, Ace? Oh, no. Well, I was just saying, um, I think it's great to just have a, a breadth of information, but I didn't, I didn't want to travel down a road thinking that this was something that I needed to learn or something that I should focus on when I should be over here if, this, if I'm trying to further my education as a momentum trader. Yes, well, let's just, talk, I, let's just sort of stick on. So you're a momentum trader, and you know one of the things that – uh, Dr. Steenbarger and I talked about at the Stock Twitch event last night. And if anyone actually can find a picture of us, anyone go to at Stock Twits. You got into the event last night? I was one of the speakers at the event. So, Dr. Steenbarger, I go there <laughs> and I'm just trying to hang out 
and mind my own business. And uh, they called me up to, I was just hanging out, talking to some people and they ended up calling me up to talk to the jam packed house of people there. And uh, so it was, it was a great event. It was a really good event. If anyone goes to StockTwits and can see some of the pictures from the event last night and put some in the chat, that would be great. If not, maybe I'll try and find some later. Um, but we talked about, and this is, this is key. So when you say you're a momentum trader, if you are a certain type of momentum trader, guess what your equity curve is going to look like. It's going to look like it's, it's going to go straight down. It's going to look like the complete opposite of what it ought to look like. And all right. So it was on stock to Instagram story. There you go. There you go. Um, is there a link to that, JD? I'm actually short snap, so I don't really know what StockTwits Instagram story is. So I'm it's sort like, of betting against snap. No, it's the, you're, no, you're. So is that different? Yeah, I Instagram, like Instagram story is just that, that's a Facebook owned. Uh, uh, yeah, I'm, I'm bullish on Instagram. Snap, I'm not bullish on. Because Instagram <laughs> is just doing what Snapchat. Gotcha. So it's Snapchat. So yeah. So Instagram is just doing what Snapchat is has done and getting their people to go watch that. Um, so we're at the event and, you know, we we're making this point that if you momentum trade certain types of stocks, you're probably not going to do very well. But one of the things that we spend a great deal of time on is being in the right stocks. So today we had Steve, Steve Spencer prepare us for the day. He'll talk about levels. He'll talk about the stocks that he's thinking about, and he's looking for the stocks that are in play. And for us, that means stocks with fresh news that's, that are unusually good or unusually bad. Stocks that are gapping up 3% or gapping down 3% on hopeful, uh, generally unusually high volume. Um, and there it is. There you go. And we are so we are gravitating to the best opportunities and you know the point that dr steenbarger was making and that, that i was confirming is that being in the right it, it's 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 more important to be in the right stocks than it is to be employing the right strategy so if you are employing a momentum trading strategy on the right stocks, then that can work. If you are employing a momentum based strategy, on the wrong stocks that won't work. And so one of the strategies, so that strategy will work when you're really looking at stocks that are in play. Okay, that strategy is not going to work if you're looking at some amorphous chart that's breaking down and it's a technical setup. Or trying to apply it to Apple every day. Yeah, or right? trying, to, yeah, or trying to apply it to Apple every day. Thank you, Mara. That, that's that's not that's that's not a successful that's not a successful approach. Um, and so, but we are. I mean, every day in the AM meeting today, we talked about SRPT. That was a tremendous opportunity. That was something that moved outside of the marketplace by a lot. And we like that for lots of different reasons. But one of the reasons we like is that it was outside the range for the option straddle before earnings. We like the fact that it gapped up. We like the fact that it had really great earnings. We like the fact that on a longer term chart, it, it looked good. We like the news catalyst in it. If you were trading a momentum based strategy today in Lowe's, L O W, and Home Depot, that would really work. That would really work. That is a that is where you need to be spending your time. And the reason why that worked today was because Amazon came out with uh, with news that they were interested in partnering up with Sears. And the way the market digested that news was, wait a second, Amazon is now entering a new business. 
Amazon is potentially now getting into a business that Lowe's and Home Depot are in. And the market reacted very negatively to that. And there was very large order flow that came in on the short side for LOW and HD. And then a little bit later in the day, there were multiple analysts that defended Home Depot and that caused a little bit of a spike. But if you look at the end of the day, Lowe's LOW finished very weakly into that last half hour, very much underperformed the entire market. I mean, the market was essentially flat today and Lowe's was down 5% and Home Depot was down about 4% and Lowe's did nothing but trade down into the, into the close. And, you know, so if you're employing a, let's just take that last trade. If you're employing a momentum based strategy, uh, below 89 cents in LOW, that would have been, that would have worked very nicely. Okay. And so, you know, an SRPT was a big winner today. If you were employing a momentum strategy, the first time SRPT got above you up today, that had a huge up move that you would have been able to make money in. Um, so the first thing is stock selection really matters. The people that make money as short term traders are in the right stocks. There are the stocks in play. People make a lot of money in that. They are low float stocks. So one of the stocks we're going to be trading tomorrow is AEZS. One of the stocks tomorrow we're going to be trading is dry ships. DRYS. I think dry ships is one of the stocks that we've made the most money on the last couple of days on the, sh even on the short side, it's, it's under a dollar. It's completely unexciting. You would think, how can we really make that much money in it? But the reason why we can make a lot of money in it is because, you know, if you are a trader at a hedge fund, you're working at a very large hedge fund the minimum amount of money you might have at your disposal is $300 million. What are you going to do with dry ships? How are you going to trade that? If you are a quantitative asset manager in charge of a billion dollars, how are you going to try dry ships? It's too small for you to trade. But if you're a prop trader or you're a retail trader at home, it isn't too small for you. It's not too expensive for you not as competitive as other uh, as, as what other people are doing. And so you can get really you can really get in there for Lowe's and Home Depot. Those are larger cap names, right? Those are thicker stocks. If you trade them on special days, if you trade them on days where they have a fresh news catalyst, you know, today, the fresh news catalyst was not striking on its face. Uh, you need to read through that Amazon partnering with Sears would negatively affect Home Depot and Lowe's because of the fact that Amazon has disrupted lots of other retailers. The, and, and we've seen this before. When Amazon has entered a particular space, look what happened when Amazon bought Whole Foods. What happened to the other grocers? What happened to Kroger's? What happened to some of the smaller grocery companies? They got crushed. The read through was Amazon's buying Whole Foods. The other grocery chains are in trouble. They got really sold off. Same thing happened again here today. So you know, where you're deploying your capital and in what stocks is, is very significant. And that takes, that takes learning. Being good at selecting stocks takes time. I mean, we really have two meetings a day. We teach everyone how to find the stocks for them to trade. Steve has a meeting and then Carlton, our floor manager, takes everybody in to our training room. And today, Dr. Steenbarger was on site coaching our guys today. And Carlton, our floor manager, Dr. Steenbarger and myself we're preparing our traders before the open to be in the right stocks. This was after all of them had done their own preparation. So before Steve's meeting, 
they were preparing as best as they possibly could to find the stocks to trade. They were looking at the levels to trade. They were thinking of the stocks that were best for them. They were creating a roadmap of how they wanted to spend their day. Some of the guys also liked UAL as a second day play based on, and we talked about that. We talked about, is that really something you want to spend your time on other than SRPT? When you look at the day today, you need to go back and say to yourself, is UAL really where I want to spend my time or should I have been in Home Depot and Lowe's? Okay. That's, that's really significant. And so, um, that, and so that's a skill and it, and it takes time and, and guys, you know, it takes them months to, to get, to get good at that and, and takes uh, day by day review. And we have an 11 o'clock meeting on our desk, which we call trader development. And we'll go in and we'll think about, do we miss something? We'll think about, you know, what's next for the day. We'll go over the best patterns from the open. You know, before the open, we, we talked about that 79, 50 ish, that 39, 50 ish level in SRPT. And what did it do on the open? dropped right to that level. We, we talked about that in our AM meeting before the open. That's, you know, that, that 39, 50-ish area was an important level to us. It wicked right down there and, and our guys were prepared for that. So, so I guess my question to you is, what kind of stocks are you trading? I think we froze a little bit there, Mara. So Ace, if you can hear us, uh, Ace, what kind of stocks what kind of stocks are you trading and what's your process to select stocks? And he has frozen. Yeah. All right. At first I thought, man, he is really, really <laughs> deep in thought. Like, give him a second. He's going to figure this out. Oh, he's coming back. So, Ace, if you can hear us, what kind of stocks uh, do you trade and what's your process for finding stocks? I think you're back. But you're muted. But you're muted. There I go. There you go. Uh, yeah, so for the type of stocks that I trade, I usually um, you start oh, with yeah. a heat map off of, um, I think it's finviz.com, see what's um, powering through for the um, at the beginning of the day. I Being that I'm on the right. West Coast around, I guess that would be 7, like 10.30, like the first um, hour. So I wait for the first hour to settle down, then I see what is um running for the day and then from those sectors i um let me go through my criteria i have a pulled up right beside me um i try to find stocks under ten dollars um average volume over um, five hundred thousand relative volume over 1.5 um if things come if i my if my results are too many i try to add a beta over zero um, look for stocks that are plus or minus between five and um, 12 percent um yeah and then i um from there once i start condensing my list then i start um my chart and technical analysis and then go from there and then watch the stocks to hope for profit all right so i'm going to type in uh, a video that we just put up and uh, the beginning of the week uh, we got a question from one of our students who uh, is training with us and has had some success in, in his trading as well and you know he asked us great question you know how do you prepare for earnings season and if you take a look at that video, take a look at the link of that video, I answer that as well. So th that should give all of you listening a pretty good primer for stock selection. And then if, if people want to dive deeper, you know, we're always around to help, you can reach out to Merritt and, and talk to us a little bit more. Um, but that was a essentially another good question we got from the trading community and, and and put that together. All right, so I stopped you, Merritt. We had a good discussion about that. Can we go back to the see if we can go back to the text of Ace's question? 
and try and help them a little bit more. Let's try to find my email. Here we go. Um, so, do you have any suggestions for a budding momentum trader? Do you think I'm relying on too many indicators and not enough on price action? Remember can earlier. I, can I now? Can I ask? Can I lean on you for this one? Because you are the. So when, you, so Ace, hey, so when you say you're relying on too many indicators, why don't, why don't you help us with uh, what indicators you're relying on? And and Merit does a really good job of using proprietary tools, but also keeping charts clean to find edge. And maybe he'll have some thoughts on on what you're looking at. So it, before you even say anything, Ace, if if you and I were were working together, and 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 you were you told me, and I, let me just quote this for everyone. Um, more of a momentum trader who plays reversal and breakout setups using FIB ratios, moving averages, MACD, and RSI. Okay, so those are the indicators used. My question right away would be: Walk me through specific the specific job of each of those indicators and what they're doing for you, and how they're a part of your decision making process for whether it's a good trade or not. Okay, or um, even a trade or not. For the um, for the fib um, levels, I what those do for me is helps very quickly. I can I, based off of the first thirty minutes of or even before trading, I, I'm able to see what levels were um, attacked the most, see the type of volume that um, when those levels were met, see how um, the market reacted to them, if it broke through, if it reversed. Um, if it so let's let's pause right there. So this is fib ratios. This is this is a standard fib retracement with like fifty and sixty eight and thirty two or whatever it is. Yeah. Okay. Um, and is that on your trading time frame, or is that on a higher time frame, or so what start, time frame do you apply that to? So I will first start on the. Um, I'll start on a daily. And then, um, well, no, first off, if I, if I like how the chart looks on a daily, I will um, use the FIB ratios on a five minute chart. Okay. Okay. Yeah. So I'd use, um, so basically, I do most of my charting on five, on um, daily and five minute charts. And then um, I go to a one minute chart when, for my exits. Okay. So that was um, that's fair. So in terms of the fib ratios, you you like the daily chart. You drill down to a five minute chart. You're you're putting the fib retracements on, and what exactly are you, you mentioned how they're reacting? So you're simply saying, is this holding the thirty eight point two? Yeah, are those are those levels that were? Um, so you know, I look left and see if those are levels that um, were recognized in the past. Um, and so if they were recognized, how many times they were to see, you know, if there's a higher probability that they'll be recognized on the right. Okay. So um, essentially it helps you get a strength rating of a support resistance level, how strong it is, or if it's just like, ah, this is a one out of 10. Yeah. Okay, great. All right. What about the moving averages? Um, I use those mostly as, um, support and resistance guides for the most part. Um, uh, there's this new, um, I forget what it's called, Busby? I wrote it down. I have to look through. But um, there's this guy, I think he's out of Australia, and he uses this technique where he uses several different moving averages. He uses um, for the short term a 3, a 5, a 8, a 10, a 12, and a 15. And then for the long term, um, 30, 35, 40, 45, 50, and a 60. So he's able to, with with those moving averages on the chart, uh, it, 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 you're able to see short term sentiment versus long term sentiment. It, I like using that to um, to gauge the strength of that moving average, as you know, it, it helps me visually a lot more versus just having one moving average that, or you know, two moving averages a long, a short term and a long term that I would just use as support and resistance. So these okay. theories of moving averages work in that same way for me. So that's what I use those for. Uh, it, <laughs> someone would have to put together a pretty good argument for me to to think that uh, various, especially moving average like bands like that, or or I forget what they call them, but when you put like a 
three, five, eight, blah, blah, or like a 35, 40, 45, all of them so close together. Um, that's usually pretty worthless. Um, mm -hmm. I, I do know what you mean in terms of, okay, longer term one here and a shorter term here. Like I, I get, I, I know how that can help you feel comfortable with, with the price action. But honestly, in this case, with those moving averages, I would really encourage um, to learn how to perhaps analyze what the trend is doing, analyze momentum within the trend. Is it weakening? Is it strengthening? Um, and then the one thing I didn't, didn't see listed anywhere in this email, other, other than you talking about, well, if I like a daily chart or five minute or one minute for your exit, I believe you said, um, is incorporating just a little bit higher time frame than perhaps your main trading time frame, like the five minute. So perhaps a 30 minute chart or an hourly chart um, and getting a sense for the same type of thing, the trend there, the momentum there, the strength and weakness, um, how it's reacting to the main levels. Adding a little bit higher time frame in addition to your five minute, that is going to be a much, much stronger and holistic and repeatable, successful process than these ribbons of moving averages that are all over the place to try and get a feel for that. Um, it's going to make you stronger as a trader to be able to analyze the fractal nature um, of various time frames and, and, and the swing highs and swing lows and how we're reacting within that. I believe a, a moving average envelope has a standard deviation component away from moving averages versus ribbons or just 5, 10, 15, just various period moving averages. For, that's for Rob. Um, so someone says a lot of retail traders use them. It's interesting to have them on the chart just to see what kind of players are playing. Um, I, anyways, let's continue with you. Um, the MACD, how are you, how are you using that? Um, to estimate oversold and over um, bought conditions, and then just the momentum of the the trade, if it's more negative or positive. So for for a momentum trader, you're probably often, and the, the same would go for the the next one on the list, the RSI. Um, you're actually probably looking for a lot of opportunities. Um, when those are actually giving you perhaps overextended readings, um, you're I've looking been... for actual continuation. Yeah. Um, I can tell you for, for a fact that MACD and RSI are most effective as tools for more range bound environments because that's just simply the math. They're looking at where price has been over a certain rolling period. And they're telling you like RSI where we are kind of within that, within that range. So obviously if we're playing momentum, we know from looking at a chart and looking at the, the relative moves of the past hour and a half, if we're breaking down, I can tell you the RSI is going to be at the low end. If we're breaking up, the RSI is going to be at the high end. Um, MACD, do you know what MACD stands for? Um, Ah, momentum. No, I'll, I'll, t I'll go ahead and tell you. It's moving average convergence or divergence. So it's essentially more moving averages that an indicator down at the bottom is telling you how far apart or above or below various period moving averages are. So that is actually, depending on the, the, the information that you're almost subconsciously getting from the all these moving averages on the chart, the MACD is actually repetitive, or the moving averages are actually repetitive, and the MACD may be an easier visualization of, of that for you. Regardless, my opinion would be to urge you to, within your setups, within exactly what you're, you're, you're looking for to pull the trigger to trade, Go and study exactly what anything you have on your charts, any of these tools. And if it is something that is helping you or helping filter the, the bad trades from the good trades in some way, then it's a, a positive thing you can use on your chart. 
Um, another thing to consider is, is it, like I mentioned earlier, is it repetitive if, in any way? We don't want anything on our charts that just reiterates the same information. Um, because look, and here's kind of the final point around this is we're humans. We're trying to operate in an environment of uncertainty. We're trying to make rapid decisions. Um, and we can only process a certain amount of information at any given time. So if these charts that are cluttered up with six different indicators and all these things, not to mention the view that we're trying to get across multiple time frames, not to mention the, the feel that we're trying to get from reading the tape and doing those kind of things. Where is the focus? Where does the focus need to be to make a certain decision, whether that's an entry or a trade management decision or a stop placement? And really, really encourage you to simplify as much as possible. Really encourage you to learn how to truly read momentum of price action itself. Um, and keep it as simple as possible because we only have so much simultaneous processing power as humans. Thanks, Merritt. A question from Noble. Hi, Bella. At times, I've observed stocks gap up, show activity like a stock in play, and then it just starts to move in a small range, like consolidation. The breakouts fail, and there are, techni are there techniques to anticipate this behavior? So one of the things that I like to look at as to uh, confirm whether or not a stock is in play is to look at Arbol. So if something is going to be dead, you're going to see Arbol below mm -hmm. one. And if something is going to really be in play, you're going to see an elevated Arbol. Which just for people that may not know exactly what that means, Arbol is stands for relative volume and one would be it's doing its exact for whatever point in time we are in the day, it's exact average volume. If it's well above one or some multiple of one, that's the multiple of its average volume that it's trading today. If it's 0.5, it's only trading half the normal volume. So it's more likely to be dead. And there are definitely tools that we developed on the desk looking at ways to give us a little bit more information. But for you guys, I think Arbol is a really good indicator to first take a look at. I think an, an, under, an underused indicator for intraday trading. Merritt, I think uh, we still have some more questions to go from Ace. If you want to get back to that, I'll, I'll bring up the uh, questions if you can see them. Yep. Uh, so first question there was around um, relying on too many indicators. and. At the end of the day, I would say yes, a little bit, especially with the moving average stuff and, and definitely learn how to read price action. Um, it's it's pivotal and adding the multiple time frames. Um, Bella, what about additional books? Um, he might be good to read. So. He's looking yeah, at I the know. daily trading coach, which is great. Yeah. Technical so analysis explained. Yeah, so another great book to read besides One Good Trade is what? The Playbook. So uh, the Playbook's a great book to read. I, I, I hear that's pretty good. Playbook is uh, the second book that I wrote, and it helps traders to build a business. It helps you to build from your strengths. It helps you to see how professional traders are much more organized from what I've heard from semi-pro traders, retail traders. It talks about, uh, it actually shares some, some give and take during our sessions, our playbook sessions internally uh, for traders. It, it talks about some trading setups that uh, guys may, may look at, but the biggest help is traders to understand that this is a business and that you ought not to put capital to work for, uh, for some spurious idea. It, it needs to be something that you have either learned or tested. It needs to 
You need to make trades that have very clear variables to them. You want to be breaking down your trades in terms of why you're getting in and why you're getting out. You know, as opposed to, I think SRPT is going to trade higher today. I think SRPT is going to trade lower today. I think AEZS is overdone and will trade lower. I don't know what that means. You know, there are, and I had a really good conversation last night with some retail traders who were succeeding. And I shared, they, they actually asked me a question about how I feel about risk management. And I shared an anecdote just from yesterday with them that some of our guys in the desk were struggling with. And so one of the guys in the desk was in a position, it was against them too much. Our floor manager called and got up and went over to the trader and said, why in a flat? And the trader said, I don't think this is a good place for me to sell it. I think this is a good place to buy it and I don't just want to puke it. And guess what Carlton said? And what should you say? You should hit out of the position. And so it may seem, it may, it may seem to some people logical that you don't hit out of a position where you think you should be buying it because then you're sort of giving away a potential profit. But what you really need to be thinking about is the proper standard. The proper standard is, can you make trades that have variables? Can you place risk for setups that you've outlined in a playbook? You know, you should have a playbook. It should sit on your desk and you ought to read through it every week. You ought to know what your strengths are. You ought to be able to tell Merritt and myself how you make money, the setups for which you make money. You ought to be building technology for those setups. But it's not good enough as an intraday trader, as a short-term trader to be right about direction. And look, that's the hardest thing to do in finance. That's why traders get paid the most. That's why this job is the top of the food chain in all of finance. There is a trillions, there is trillions of dollars out there in business that is set up to help people like us, to help people who make directional decisions. But it's not good enough to just pick direction. You have to also pick direction within your guardrails. You have to place trades that are right, that pay, that are within your guardrails. And there's a very simple reason for why you need to do that. And what is that? Why is it not good enough? And what kind of a trader are you if you're not placing trades for which you're right, but also staying with inside your guardrails. What kind of a trader are you? And I would suggest you're not a particularly valuable trader. A, there's going to be a time if you trade long enough for when you decide in your infinite wisdom as one player in the marketplace of trillions of dollars traded every day with people who have uh, different needs than you, that doesn't make sense. There are going to be ETFs, markets, stocks, products that go down too far for too long and up too far for too long that make any sense. And that's the game. And they will go down further than you can stay in the game and they will go up higher than you can stay in the game as well. And so if you do not trade within guardrails, you're going to blow up. You're going to blow up. And secondly, if you don't trade within guardrails, you're never going to be able to trade big. And or you're going to be a trader that has a psychology that's very stressful, that 
is unsustainable. You take a really big rip and something that's irrational on a trade that you know has edge, good luck trying to make that trade again the next time. Good luck really placing on the real risk in that trade the next time you see it. You're not going to do it. You're human. No one is going to give you a lot of capital if you are not a trader who controls risk. And you shouldn't give yourself a lot of capital if you can't control your risk as well. And I had a conversation with somebody last night and uh, you go to these events and this person was bragging and bragging and bragging about how much money they made on a weekly basis. I asked them a couple of questions about their trading and they talked about how you know, they sit through the pain and they talked about the amazing returns they have. And I instantly know the person was FOS. I instantly knew it. I've traded long enough. That's not how you make money. There's this, this person was making up a story about how much money they were making. And I'm not, I'm not being uh, quick to judge about that. I've seen thousands of traders over the years and I know who makes money and I know who doesn't. And there are eternal rules to how to play this game. You can't be a trader who doesn't trade without guardrails. You can't be a trader who doesn't have a specific risk that you're going to put on per trade. You cannot be a sustaining trader. You cannot be a big trader if you can't have setups that work best for you, that fit your cognitive and personality strengths, and also trade within guardrails. It cannot happen. You might have a run for a short period of time, and then you're going to blow up. You might have a run during a particular marketplace, and then that market is going to change, and you're going to be in trouble. You know, right now, the low volatility strategies are working great. One of these days, they're not. And if you don't trade within guardrails, you're going to make a lot of money during this period, and you're going to lose all of it during the next. If you're a pullback trader in 2007 and 2008, and you don't have guardrails, you're going to get crushed. If you're only a long trader in 2007 and 2008, you're going to get crushed. If you're only a short trader, you're going to get run over for long periods of time without guardrails. So the idea, the idea is for you to be a sustaining, healthy, consistently profitable, scalable, scalable trader who can put money into strategies that fit your unique talents in a way that we want to give you more and more money. And so, because you, because you can become big that way. I've said this before. I've had guys who are making $4,000 a month for which we did very little other than tell them to do what they're doing bigger, who make over $100,000 on most months. Because they're scalable. They're healthy, they're scalable, they know what they're doing. They're trading systems that complement, supplement, and highlight their cognitive and personality strengths. So, a playbook's a good book. There's a lot in it. Um, Lots of people love to read Jack Schwager's books in our community. Lots of people love to read Mark Douglas. What's a favorite book uh, from you, Merritt? Uh, definitely Mark Douglas, Trading in the Zone is, is way up there. Um, I also love the Steenbarger book that Ace asked about, The Daily Trading Coach. Sure. Um, one of my favorite little secret books uh, is not a trading book, but I it's one of my favorite trading books. Um, it's called The Truth About Winning, and it's actually a tennis book, um, just a little paperback thing. Sometimes sells well, for as high as $200 on Amazon. One of my favorite books is uh, Golf's Not a Game of Perfect by yeah. Dr. Bob Rotella. Yep. The Inner Game of Tennis. Fantastic. Yeah. Um, and, I, uh, I, I use a strategy, you know, that frames context with a tool called market profile and volume profile. So obviously a lot of my, my favorite books are, are by Jim, Jim Dalton. Jim Dalton, the Godfather. 
Pete Stiedelmeyer, Don Jones, all those guys. Hey, and you're going to an event next week. Yeah, yeah. Early next week, I'll be in Chicago for a, an event with Market Delta. Uh, Dr. Steenbarger will be there as well. Looking forward to rubbing shoulders with some other people who use market profile and order flow tools to, to trade futures. It's going to be awesome. All right, great. Um, and Ace, any other questions we can answer for you while we're here? So any other areas you wish you had avoided altogether? So I think Merritt started to touch upon this. When I make a trade decision, I think of five factors. I think about the big picture. What kind of market are we in? So what kind of a market are we in? We're in a really strong marketplace. And I'm not going to wax poetic about the fundamentals, but the underlying theme of the marketplace is it goes higher as long as monetary policy globally is cheap. As long as the federal banks, uh, the foreign banks are making it easy to borrow money, making it cheap to borrow money, there's no better place for yield than stocks. And the, the theme has been running for since 2009. And some of the guys are joking on the desk, what would, what would it take for the market to go down? And so you probably need to change that regime for the marketplace to go down. There could be an intervening event which would shape a different answer. But, but that's the big picture of the marketplace we're in. Buying pullbacks works. And it works because there's bids in the marketplace and there's bids in the marketplace because people are searching for yield and stocks, U.S. stocks are the best place for that. And so the big picture, I like to look at longer term and intraday technicals for a particular decisions. So when we were thinking about trading SRPT, we were looking at longer term support and longer term resistance to help shape where we thought entry and exits were best we're taking a look at reading the tape. So that's a skill that we have that helps us enter so that we control our risk reward better and exit so we control our risk reward better and see where to add size and control our risk reward better. It's a skill of an intraday trader. And it also helps us just find certain trades that in a, in a momentum market, in a high volatility momentum market that you wouldn't see or you'd see late on charts. And one of the main differences between an intraday trader leaning off of the underlying psychology and, and seeing what other participants are doing and where they're wrong and having that type of knowledge um, and reading the tape and leaning off of exactly where someone is making a certain trade decision and you can see them showing that size, you can see them transacting that size. These are tangible things, right? These are things that someone is doing in the marketplace. This is an area that I learned through trading where someone is likely wrong. Someone is feeling pain here, understanding the other side. Those kind of things, especially down to reading the tape that Bella just talked about. Do you see how much different that is than, oh, look, we're retracing 32.8% of the prior move. Oh, look, this mathematically derived indicator is above 80 or below 20 those things are what's the term what's the word esoteric you know um like they're not tangible fundamental actual tradable things that are a part of the marketplace and so you know that's kind of the gist of like my main um suggestion to you today is to gravitate towards the real marketplace what uh, learn to see what other real traders are doing um and where they might be wrong and that's going to help you um, get get an uh, improvement edge. So we want to look at so we want to look at that. We want to look at the tape. I do use my intuition um, as an experienced trader, but it's not the only thing that I use. I, I put together the big picture, technical analysis, reading the tape, and I also take a look at the intraday fundamentals. So the news catalyst that's behind a particular stock. If something is unusually positive, I'm gonna be shy to be 
short. If something's unusually negative, I'm going to be shy to be long. That's going to help shape my decision. It's not going to make my decision. It's going to help shape my decision along with those other factors. And within the construct of those factors, I'm building setups that make the most sense to me. And within those successful setups that I measure, we use something called the SMBU Performance Center. We keep our stats, we're measuring things every day. Within that, I create a playbook that is best for me. So Ace, we'll let you, any other questions we can answer for you before we, we head out? Um, aside from the, um, the Arval, if, are there any other things that you, or any other specifics or um, small specifics that you look for when um, screening for, for um, new, um, new stocks that are in play? So, you know, it's earnings season right now. Uh, we actually create the sheet, and what our guys do is th they put down the stocks that are most in play, and they're deriving them from st uh, stocks. So, I, you know, one of my favorite things to look at is one of my favorite setups is something that, particularly in this market, for something that misses for the full year on guidance and is gapping down more than 10%. And some time goes by, it's past 10, 15, and it's holding below VWAP. That's, that's, that's one of the, my, my favorite setups to take a look at. Um, it's a good one. Question that also came in here is, wondering if you guys can give us an example of a model just to get an idea. So, you know, we do modeling and back testing here. Uh, can you give me an example of a model just to get an idea of how to start thinking about making further models? Uh, thanks. And so my answer to that is uh, no. That was my answer too. I already <laughs> typed it in there. <laughs> but I said he needs to he needs to check out Andrew Faldi. Andrew Faldi will, in a, his options and system testing workshop, he'll get a group together and he'll be like, all right, guys, what do you want to test today? And they'll come up with some idea, whether it's VWAP or some moving averages or whatever, and they'll start a back test. They'll see if there's any edge there. They'll work it all the way through um, into like coding up some model stuff. So he's a great resource for that. But in, we're not going to share our proprietary. Well, I models. can't. Yeah. I can't. Uh, I, I don't. Traders build the models, and it's uh, their IP and the firm's IP, and it's not for me to give away. Um, so, but you know, one of the things that, one of the things that's important is that you want to be innovating and you want to be coming up with things that are new and you want to be testing things. The guys who have the most money in the marketplace are who? They're quantitative asset managers and they are, they are dissecting unique data sets and they're finding setups that we might not be able to see presently. And so while that is the far extreme of how the most sophisticated players are doing things, that same principle can apply to you, which is, are you doing something that's unique? Are you doing something that uh, really does have edge? Are you thinking about uh, things a little bit differently that also complement your personality and talents? Um, actually, one of my guys uh, is working on a new strategy around earnings season which I am so impressed about and I have been trading it um, on, on small scale to check it out. And essentially the, the idea was get, S, get long SRPT and get long uh, Netflix and uh, a couple others. There's another stock today to get short and we've been sort of, he's tested, he's back tested it and I've been playing around with it. Um, and so that sort of shows you the idea that we're always looking for, I mean, it wasn't my idea, but I'm always interested in different ways to attack markets. And we want our guys to be back testing, innovating, coming up with new ideas, looking at things differently. Ace, I appreciate you coming. I appreciate you guys. Thanks for all the answers. That, <clears throat> excuse me, that's definitely helped a lot. I truly appreciate it.
And for you guys, uh, for you guys, you know, we're always happy to answer questions. I'll put up uh, our email address. If you want to reach out to Merit or myself, uh, there you go. And you know, happy to answer questions. Got a couple of really good questions from the community this week. Uh, Merit, any other chat? Any other questions we need to hit? Looks like we're all good. Looks like we got to everyone. Yep, and I was then, answering them in the chat. Uh, last, last reminder, guys. If you want to talk to Merit for an hour and go over your trading, that uh, that special is what Merit. I believe it's it's seventy nine bucks, um, and it's I'm sure we won't be doing it forever. I don't know what the timetable is, but uh, it's it is a, a limited opportunity. So definitely, even if you want to schedule it for a month or so down the road, which a couple people have already done, um, definitely reach out and take advantage of that. And I'll, I'll give you everything I got. I promise you that. I'll uh, I'll grill you to the best of my ability. Okay. Thanks everyone. We'll talk to you guys next week.